show up, which is great. 721 um, subscribers. That is definitely the most popular either of us will ever be on uh, <laughs> social <laughs> <No>. media. <laughs> Okay, looks like we are up and live on YouTube. Um, yeah, Jocelyn, I was just gonna say about uh, about mention you mentioning Denise's point. It's crazy for I think for me anyway, um, coming into cell migration research where like I always thought collective migration was super interesting and super cool. I didn't even know that it wasn't a popular topic, you know, initially. Which is it's it's crazy. It's crazy for me to to think that like. Why wouldn't it be super interesting to everybody forever? Well, I think, you know, obviously the work, the fabulous work of Peter Friedel has really opened this up in a fantastic way. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, some of the connections that he made in the early 2000s, people were like, OK, this is something we really need to pay attention to. Yeah, that's a really good point. Okay. All right, so for everybody who's um, just tuning in and uh, waiting, we'll get started in probably about two minutes. Do you want to put on your Spotify, Jen? background music. I actually didn't figure out the right way to do that. There is a way to share, um, which somebody had told us last week. My yeah, like friend, computer audio, right? Exactly. My friend and I started co-working together, even though we live in different states where we um, were on Zoom. We put on shared music and, you know, work for, for a while. It's, it's like pandemic equivalent of, you know, meeting up for a coffee and, and a coffee date for working. So it's actually kind of nice. It's cool that technology. I mean, imagine how much worse this would all be, right? <laughs> but no meetings at all. <laughs> well, no meetings might be good, but you know, no connecting with people. Yeah. Could be worse. Yeah, I'll give it another minute and then get started. Uh, Andrew and Jocelyn, do you want us to ask people to, do you want cameras to look at when you're uh, presenting or you don't mind? Up to you. I'm okay either way, staring into the void yeah. or, or, or <laughs> okay. at people's faces. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I, I'm ha I mean, I'm, I'm happy for people to be on. I, I'd like to see people in the audience. So. Okay. So then everyone, if you want to turn your cameras on, you're more than welcome. <laughs> Okay, so I'll get started then. So hi everyone, welcome to another week. We've got two speakers today. So our first speaker is Andrew Clark. Andrew did his uh, PhD and a short postdoc in Eva Pulis lab. He then joined the Institute Curies to do a postdoc in Daniela Vinyabrik's lab, where he's been studying collective migration in different contexts, including developing microfluidic devices to understand chemotaxis and analyzing jamming transitions in different models. Currently, he's focused on studying collective migration of small groups of cells and how their interactions with the environment influence migration dynamics. And today he'll be talking to us about how viscoelastic relaxation of collagen networks provides a self-generated polarity cue for directional for, for collective migration. Yes. Can I share my screen now? Yeah, go for it, please. Okay. All right, great. Well, thanks very much uh, for the introduction, Adam, and thanks a lot for the invitation to uh, to talk at the seminar series. It's been uh, you guys have done a really fantastic job of organizing this, and I'm really happy to be able to participate. 
Um, so as Adam said, I'm going to be talking about uh, how viscoelastic relaxation in collagen gels can help to provide uh, self-directed polarity cue during collective migration. And so I'll start by motivating this uh, with kind of a, a schematic of the metastatic cascade, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in one form or another. Um, and so for carcinomas or uh, cancers of epithelial origin, which make up about 80% of human disease, um, uh, 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 Epithelial cells are normally apicobasally polarized and they sit on top of a basement membrane. And at early stages of tumor formation, uh, cells lose their apicobasal polarity and begin to hyperproliferate. And this leads to a stage of carcinoma in situ where the tumor is still encapsulated by the basement membrane. And at later, more invasive stages, uh, the basement membrane becomes breached and this allows cells from the primary tumor to exit into the surrounding stroma. And the uh, this stroma is a, uh, uh, a network primarily made of collagen one uh, fibers uh, along with other ECM components and other cell types as well. And once inside of the stroma, the cells or groups of cells can migrate uh, through this environment and find circulatory vesicles and they can intravasate and be carried to secondary organs where they can recolonize and form metastases. And so one of the aspects of this process that we're particular interest, particularly interested in in our lab is trying to understand how cells uh, migrate in these stroma-like networks of collagen one. And it's becoming really increasingly clear from human pathology that uh, cells don't necessarily tend to disseminate as single cells, but rather very often as, as small groups of cells. And uh, so one, one aspect of this that we're particularly interested in is trying to understand what is the role of the mechanical and topological properties of extracellular matrices in cell migration. And there have been a number of labs who, who have uh, worked on this process, uh, who, who have looked at these aspects of, of interactions between the ECM and, and during cell migration. And so in this particular experiment, uh, a group of cells is embedded in an isotropic collagen network shown here on the left. And in that situation, the cells don't really have any preferred directionality. They tend to migrate in, a random, in random directions. But if you stretch this kind of a collagen network, this causes the uh, collagen fibers to align along the uh, axis of stretch. And then cells tend to follow, uh, uh, follow, their migration patterns tend to follow this axis of alignment. And so this is not only something that's been observed uh, in vitro, but is also uh, relevant for, di for disease as well. And this can be seen in the tumor associated collagen signature or so-called TACs. Um, and so at early stages uh, or, or, or non-invasive stages of cancer, uh, stromal collagen uh, is organized, tends to be organized uh, in smaller fibers that are organized more isotropically. And at later stages or more invasive stages of cancer, uh, Collagen fibers tend to be organized uh, as large bundles, which are uh, aligned perpendicular to the tumor edge. And the going idea in the field is that uh, tumor cells can use these uh, large collagen bundles as so-called highways in order to exit the primary tumor and really get out into the stromal environment. And at the same time, in addition to the fact that the mechanic, mechanical and topological properties of networks can dictate cell migration uh, dynamics, uh, the cells themselves can also uh, have some influence on what the local collagen network looks like. And so our labs, our lab and others uh, have looked at how uh, uh, large aggregates of cells can reorganize, uh, locally reorganize collagen networks. And so this can be seen if you, uh, for example, embed a large spheroid of cells inside of a collagen network. And uh, as you can see, I, th I think most clearly here uh, in this example in the top right, uh, these are, these are mammary acini that are sitting on top of a collagen network and here, these large groups of cells use mechanical force to, to physically pull on the collagen network. And this results in the formation of large parallel bundles, which cells can then later use uh, to migrate on, on uh, to get out of these acini in sort of an invasive-like migration. And so when we started to think about this problem more, uh, one thing became really clear to us. And that is that cells actually use the same kind of machinery to migrate as they do to reorganize these uh, extracellular matrix networks. So if we think about cell migration in here, just a very simple uh, schematic view of, of individual cell migration, actin filaments near the leading edge polymerize to push the membrane forward. Uh, and by the, uh, uh, by, by the motor activity of myosin motors for their back, this creates a retrograde flow on the actin filaments that pulls them in a retrograde manner. And these are then coupled to the substrate by adhesions such as focal adhesions. This results in attraction force uh, that, that, that faces uh, sort of rearward uh, with respect to the, to the protrusion direction. 
And so these rearward traction forces not only help to aid uh, forward migration, but if these cells are then sitting on top of a deformable substrate, such as a collagen network, this is also going to pull on the collagen network and deform it. And so what we're interested in understanding is how does this kind of real-time network deformation affect migration dynamics? In other words, how do cells or groups of cells during migration uh, uh, physically uh, uh, reorganize the local collagen network? And how does the, this reorganization then influence the migration dynamics? And so in order to test this, uh, we started with just a very simple assay where we made small clusters of cells and we plated them on top of uh, soft polyacrylamide gels that are either coated with a thin collagen network, which can be seen on the top, or just monomeric collagen on the bottom. And when we started to look at how these cells migrate, uh, we, we noticed very early that the migration dynamics were very, very different in these situations. And so whereas, whereas uh, cell clusters on uh, soft gels with monomeric collagen tend to just sort of turn around in circles and don't really make any migratory process, uh, so to speak, the uh, cl cell clusters that are migrating on collagen networks migrate in a persistent fashion. So they'll pick a certain direction, migrate for a number of hours, they'll maybe change direction and then, and then pick that new uh, direction of migration for several hours. And so uh, the effect that this has, if you look at sort of a population uh, of cell clusters, is that for clusters migrating on collagen networks, this means that they end up exploring a very large uh, area uh, with respect to their substrate, whereas uh, on monomeric collagen, the, they don't because they're basically turning in circles all the time. And so we can analyze the dynamics of this migration, uh, for example, by looking at the differences uh, in instantaneous speed. And so cell clusters tend to migrate a little bit faster when they're on collagen networks. And we can also look at uh, uh, the mean square displacement, and we can fit this in order to uh, extract a measure of the persistence, which I'll just call the coefficient of persistence for this talk. And, and, and this, is, this is also significantly higher when cell clusters are migrating on networks compared to monomeric collagen. And so we then wanted to try to understand, well, what's driving this uh, spontaneous persistent migration on, of, of cell clusters on collagen networks? And so we started by uh, looking at where the migration machinery is actually localized in, in these cells. And so we started by just staining for things like rho GTPases. And what we found is that strikingly in these kinds of clusters, what we see is that rho GTPases and other sort of cortical components tend to be localized around the periphery of the cluster, but they tend to be downregulated from the junctions that are inside of the cluster. So you can see the junctions really clearly in the F actin signal, but if you look at RACT, it's really only localized to the very outside. And so what this tells us is that these small cell clusters kind of act like giant supercells. So they really have the kind of morpho morphological characteristics of one, of one big cell that's migrating as a single unit. And so this has already been uh, seen before uh, in the lab of Eric Sahai, and they worked out the, the, the mechanism by which this happens uh, a number of years ago. And so, uh, and, and, and so uh, in order to study this further and to try to understand how this can influence uh, migration, uh, we, we, we got a, uh, constitutively, uh, a, a cell line that constitutively expresses uh, mice and light chain DFP from Eric, and we looked at how uh, how myosin localization changes with respect to migration direction. And so here we can segment these cell clusters and we can look at the myosin intensity just around the very outside. So in this kind of cortical region of the, of the clusters. And if we look at successive time points, we can, we, can, we, can, we can measure where the cell is moving. And so this is given by this red arrow here. And then we could look at what is the, what is the uh, relative intensity of myosin at different angles around the, uh, around the cell cluster during migration. And then we can take all of our time points and we can reorient them so that the migration direction is always pointing up. And then we have an idea of whether the myosin localization is polarized or not. And what we see is that it's not polarized. So we see a homogeneous distribution of myosin around, uh, around the periphery of the cluster with respect to the migration direction. Okay, so it seems like these cells don't necessarily have any very strong uh, uh, front back polarity as, as, as we can see. And so we started trying to entertain some other kinds of hypotheses. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, one thing that we're really interested in is trying to understand what is the influence of the underlying extracellular matrix network. And so in order to do that, we started doing some live imaging experiments with fluorescently labeled uh, collagen networks. 
And so one thing that really popped out at us when we started, when we started doing these experiments is that there really seemed to be a, a large dense mass of collagen that seemed to kind of follow the cluster around. So we always found this uh, in sort of the back half of the cluster during migration. And we can quantify this if we compare uh, the migration direction at every time point, which is given here by this white arrow with a vector that points from the middle of the cluster to a weighted center of mass of the collagen. And that's given by this, uh, this magenta arrow here. And so this is more or less a measurement of where uh, to tell us where the collagen is most concentrated under the cluster. And as you can see, uh, when, I, when I play this movie and also from this rose plot, that these tend to have an angular uh, difference of about 180, meaning that they're pointing always away from each other. And this tells us that the collagen signal tends to be polarized uh, toward, toward the rear of the, uh, of the cluster during migration. And so we can look at that a little bit more closely if we take our uh, cluster segmentations and we then split them up from front to back in equally equal length segments. And so we can do this for every time point and we can do averaging over a number of different clusters during migration. And then we can get uh, sort of an average uh, view of what is of what is the collagen density uh, along the length of the cluster during migration. And what we find is that the collagen density tends to peak toward the toward the rear or toward the back of the cluster. And so this is kind of another way to measure what we had already seen before. And this gives us sort of uh, now we have kind of kind of some kind of axis of polarity where we have an asymmetric distribution of collagen that can that can set some kind of axis of polarity. And uh, we, so we wanted to try to understand, well, how could this kind of collagen signal uh, arise in the first place? And, and, and what do the mechanical properties of, of, of the network, uh, how, how can these kind of influence that? And so one, one property of the networks, of these collagen networks that we're particularly interested in is, 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 the, is the viscoelastic behavior. And so um, viscoelastic materials can be said to behave either like a solid or like a liquid or a combination of both, depending on the time scale of their perturbation. And I think one really great example of this that maybe some of you are familiar with is, uh, is, is silly putty. So it's a, it's a child's toy, I, I think from the, from the 50s. And so this is, this is a very good classic example of a viscoelastic material. So if you take silly putty, or you can find other kinds of putties that are used for hand therapy, uh, and, and you can roll them up in a ball, and if you bounce this on a table and you can throw it against a table or drop it on a table and it will bounce back up. And so this means that on very, very short time scales, on sub second time scales, this material acts like uh, uh, an elastic solid because this is kind of what a rubber ball would do. Uh, but if you then put the same ball on top of a ring stand uh, and you wait 10 minutes, then it starts to, starts to trip and, and it, it looks like uh, what honey would do, uh, dripping off of, off of your spoon. Um, and so you can say that on time scales of 10 minutes, this material acts like uh, a, a viscous liquid. And so we have now in the same material, we have either solid-like or viscous-like, uh, liquid-like behavior, depending on the time scale uh, that you're looking at. And so we wanted to, to try to measure this kind of behavior in, in collagen networks uh, with with uh, uh, physical forces that are, that are generated by the cell clusters themselves. And so in order to do that, we took our cell clusters and we put them, we plated them again on uh, soft polyacrylamide gels. And here we're putting, we're putting beads in the polyacrylamide gels so we can, so we can, measure, uh, so we can measure displacements or traction forces in the, in the substrate. And we coated this then with a thin layer of collagen uh, network as well and put the clusters on top. And so, so we can look at the displacements in, in, the, in, in the underlying gel. Uh, and, and here I'm just reporting uh, the, the, the displacements and not, not actually calculating the traction forces. Um, but what we see essentially is that these cells tend to pull on, their, pull on their network. So they pull inward and they also push downward on their network. And so we wanted to know, well, do, can, we, can we have a way where we can very quickly release these uh, forces that are generated by the cell clusters and see what happens to the collagen network? So in order to do that, we just threw some ammonium hydroxide on the cells and this essentially causes them to just explode instantaneously and then they float away. And so what we see in this rapid cell removal assay is that we basically, all of, all of the displacements or the, or, or the sort of, uh, which represents the, the, the mechanical uh, traction force that these cells are exerting, this essentially goes to zero immediately. So we know with this assay that as soon as we put the ammonium hydroxide on, we're losing all of the mechanical force that the cells are generating. And so we can now compare that to what happens uh, in terms of the collagen signal. So we can again use our fluorescent collagen uh, 
And we can now look at what happens to the collagen when we, when we put the ammonium hydroxide on and, and quickly get rid of the cells. And so what you can already maybe see from these movies is that uh, the collagen does take a little while until it completely relaxes. And so we can measure this either by looking at the density in this, in this region where the cells previously were, or by tracking uh, 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 movements of the collagen with PIV. And so we can then extract uh, a time scale for this collagen relaxation, which is significantly longer than what we see for the relaxation of forces. And this gives us, gives, us, gives us a way to quantify how fast the collagen networks are relaxing. And so if we compare uh, uh, over, over a number of different experiments, uh, the relaxation time of these sum displacements, which again uh, represents uh, the mechanical force that's being exerted, uh, and we compare that to the collagen, uh, we see a significant difference here, and this gives us a relaxation time of the collagen of about 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, how does this actually, how does viscoelasticity in collagen networks, how is this going to influence the local patterns of, of, of collagen during migration? Well, if we think about a really simple situation where we have a cell that's exerting radial force on its, on its substrate, uh, it, it, if the cell is initially at rest, it's going to, it's going to cause a deformation on the substrate and the substrate is going to be more concentrated in the middle. Okay, so this is going to cause the substrate to kind of contract on itself right in the middle. And so initially this is going to be, this is going to be a symmetric situation. And if we think about what happens on an elastic substrate, as soon as the cell moves from its initial position, this uh, deformation in the substrate is going to essentially follow it because the substrate is elastic it has to respond immediately to any change in the pattern of force of the cells. But if we now think about what happens on a viscoelastic substrate, the initial situation is the same. So we have a symmetric pattern of substrate deformation uh, uh, while the cell is not moving. But as soon as the cell moves, the uh, collagen network is gonna take a little while to, to relax and to its, to its sort of ground state. And so in, in between then, when the cell is moved, uh, that means that we're gonna have kind of an we're going to have this, this time period where we're going to start to see an asymmetric distribution in, in the collagen network. And that's really similar to what we see in our experiments. And so in order to kind of formalize this and to see how this might impact cell migration, uh, we teamed up with a couple of, of theorists. Uh, Ananyo, who is a postdoc in the lab of Raphael Vorturier, who uh, works just down the street from us in Paris. And they developed a theoretical model of cell migration on viscoelastic substrates. And so in this analytical model, uh, there, are, there are a few different important components. So we have uh, a, a point particle, which represents our, our migrating cluster, which can move along, uh, which can move along a one dimensional axis with velocity V. And it has a probability of switching directions that's given by this time scale tau E. And during migration, uh, this, this uh, cluster or, or, or point particle can interact with the substrate uh, mechanically via this forcing function G. And this forcing function will then induce a deformation of the substrate, which is given by S, which could for our experiments, for example, represent changes in local collagen density. And these changes in the substrate can then further back feedback on the, on the, cell, uh, on the cell cluster by this, by this coupling term. And the substrate itself uh, can, can, can be uh, characterized by a particular, particular viscoelastic time scale. Uh, uh, tau r, which we can also measure for our collagen networks, as well as a, a deformation length scale l. And so Ananyo and Raphael basically drew up the simplest analytical model they could based on these kind of interactions, where we have a linear relationship between the substrate deformation, uh, the substrate uh, cluster coupling, and, and the velocity of these cells. Okay, so now, so now, so now, so now what, what do we get out of this model? So if we start again with our, with our simple scenario where we have a, a, a cluster of cells that's initially apolar, so it's, it's exerting equal mechanical force all around the, the periphery of the cell. Uh, if, if this is initially at rest, we're going to expect to see a symmetric distribution between our forcing function G and the substrate deformation S. And if, uh, if we now have these on a viscoelastic substrate, this situation becomes unstable. So as long as the coupling is, is sufficiently large above a critical value, we have a supercritical bifurcation. And what this means is that the cells are not gonna stay stationary, but they're spontaneously gonna start moving forward or backward. And so this gives us a mechanism for spontaneous symmetry breaking in this kind of system. And once the cells have broken symmetry and start migrating, what we expect to see from this model is that 
uh, we're going to start to see an asymmetry in, in this uh, substrate, uh, uh, substrate deformation, S, uh, with respect to, to the forcing function. And this is going to lead to a situation where we have high persistence migration. And in fact, the persistence of migration, which is given by this time scale tau e, we expect will depend on the viscoelastic relaxation of the collagen network or the, or the, or the viscoelastic substrate itself. And so we expect that for an elastic substrate or a substrate that has a very low relaxation time, that we no longer have this asymmetry in the, uh, in the substrate deformation, and that here we're going to see a low persistence migration. And so what we have from this model are a couple of important predictions. One is that if we reduce the substrate relaxation time, we expect this to lead to less persistent migration. And the second prediction is that small clusters or even single cells would not be able to migrate as persistently. And I'll come back, back to that in a couple of slides why. So starting with, 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 with tackling, tackling the, the, the prediction of uh, looking at relaxation time, we can modulate relaxation time in these collagen networks by chemically crossing the network, cross-linking the networks. And we can do this with a small sugar, a small sugar called uh, threos. And so we can pre-treat these networks before we put the cells on with this cross-linker. And then we can measure what is the difference in the relaxation time if in, in cross-link networks compared to the non-cross-link networks. And so in order to do this, we again use this rapid cell removal assay and, and we use PIV to measure uh, the changes in, in, in the collagen over time. And so what we see from this is that uh, with our cross-link networks, we see a, a lower relaxation time. Uh, uh, and, and, and so now the model predicts that this should lead to uh, more symmetric distributions of collagen and, uh, and, and less persistent migration. And so we can look at this, this uh, the, the former by, by doing these assays where we, where we look at cell migration with fluorescent collagen networks. And whereas in the control situation, Again, we see this characteristic asymmetric peak toward the back of the cluster. In the cross-linked gels, this peak now starts to appear in the middle of the cluster, meaning that we no longer have an asymmetry in the collagen distribution. And we can look at what the effect is on migration persistence by doing uh, migration assays uh, with, with different cross-linking conditions. And so uh, what, whereas uh, these cell clusters uh, migrate, tend to migrate at the same speed with cross-linked or uncross-linked gels, they migrate with much less persistence uh, in, in, in the cross-link gels. Um, and, so, um, and so that's the first prediction of the model. Okay, so the second prediction of the model is that we would expect that smaller clusters or single cells would not be able to migrate persistently. And there are a couple of reasons for that. So the first one is that smaller clusters would be expected to exert less total force on, on the substrate itself, and this would result in smaller network deformations. And so we can do that by doing this kind of 3D displacement microscopy experiments, where we're looking at how much, uh, how much uh, 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 basically how much these cells are, uh, are, are deforming their network. And so the sum, the sum of the displacements is higher for larger clusters, uh, but tends to be much lower for, for smaller clusters and for single cells. And so, so that's the first reason we expect less persistent migration. The second reason is that single cells or very small clusters are, are in fact too small to see a collagen density gradient. And so the collagen network itself is gonna be characterized by uh, deformation length. And so this is gonna set the length scale over which a gradient of collagen, uh, over, over which uh, a dense region of collagen will decay over space. And so if the cells are very small with respect to this distance, that means they're gonna be kind of sitting right on top, of the, on top of this dense area of collagen, and they're not gonna be able to see the gradient because they're just too small. And so uh, again, if we look at uh, what happens with the clusters, we see this characteristic peak of collagen density toward the rear. But if we look at the collagen density over the length of single cells, they basically see no gradient at all. So they're gonna get no polarity cue uh, for, for where they need to migrate. And, uh, uh, and, and so the model uh, then predicts in this kind of situation that we won't, we won't be able to see any, uh, that, that single cells will migrate less persistently. And so if we compare cluster migration to single cell migration, the single cells migrate really erratically. They just kind of go back and forth all the time. And, and, and so they have a very, very, very low persistence migration, which you can see here on the right. Uh, and they migrate a, a little bit slower as well. And so, um, I'll just quickly uh, summarize uh, the theory and experiments. Um, and so 
we're, we're looking at uh, migration of uh, small clusters of cells on collagen networks, which don't appear to have any strong intrinsic polarity mechanisms. And so for clusters at rest, uh, this means that clusters will pull on, their, pull on their environment and cause a deformation that's initially symmetric. And once these clusters start moving on a viscoelastic substrate with sufficiently high relaxation time, we expect, and we do in fact see, an asymmetric distribution in, in the substrate, um, uh, substrate deformation, and this leads to persistent migration. And if we cross-link the networks, so we make the, uh, the relaxation time lower, this leads to a more symmetric distribution of collagen and lower persistence migration. And similarly, if we compare this then to the migration of single cells on collagen networks, single cells uh, exert less, less force and deform the network uh, to a lesser degree and are small compared to the deformation length of collagen and thus don't see a collagen gradient. And as a result, they also migrate in a less persistent manner. And so I'd like to just quickly uh, acknowledge the uh, Vinyevich lab and in particular, the people who, whose names are listed here uh, for their direct contributions to this project. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, a number of collaborators as well as our facilities at Institute Curie. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Andrew. That was really interesting. Uh, we've got some questions, which we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can. If we go over, then we'll let you address them in the chat, maybe. Uh, so we'll start with a question from Claire Waterman, who says, are the clusters radially symmetric or not during migration? You didn't really address that, and yet your model is based on that. So, I mean, I guess there are a lot of different ways you can you can measure radial symmetry. It depends on what you're looking at. So in terms of shape, they are radial symmetric. So we can look at, uh, you know, different shape factors and for instance like aspect ratios and there's no i mean there's no correlation between between the aspect ratio for example of uh of the, of the cluster itself and where it moves so clusters can be elongated but this doesn't necessarily dictate whether they move forward or or sideways um and i mean radial symmetry in terms of sort of biochemical signaling is something that we're looking into uh, a little bit more so i mean we don't see any so we see radial symmetry uh with, uh, with the myosin at this point, uh, but we're looking at, we're starting to look at things like uh, row activity as well to see if this is radially uh, symmetric too. Um, I, I, I will say maybe that the, the traction forces that we measure are not necessarily radially symmetric. So we have a slightly different distribution of the, of the traction forces in the front versus the back. And I mean, if, if the traction forces were completely exactly the same in the front and back, we wouldn't expect to see any motion at all. So we, so we need to have some kind of asymmetry in the distribution. Um, so we see that the traction forces are a little bit higher magnitude toward the back, uh, but they have a shorter tail. Um, and so it, it, it's really hard though to say whether this is kind of a cause or, or effect. So this could be kind of giving a polarity cue or this could be sort of a reaction to the local differences in the, uh, in the local uh, collagen structure. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Claire. So from uh, Abhishek Mukherjee, sorry, excuse me. Um, how do you decouple focal adhesion dependent mechanics on the underlying collagen fibers and viscoelastic deformation of collagen? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so that, that's something that we're starting to look at now. So we're now, we're now currently, we're just finishing making um, some, uh, some, uh, some cell lines that have live uh, focal adhesion markers, and we're going to start to look at look at turnover. Um, so that could be one thing that kind of um, one thing that kind of represents our substrate cell coupling that we have in the model. Right? We don't really know exactly what the what the origin of this is, and so one possibility is that focal adhesion stability, for example, could be different in the front versus the back, and that stability could be dictated by the difference in what the collagen network looks like. And so here we would sort of have both of these things working together, right? So we would still have still the, the, the local uh, distribution of what the collagen network looks like would basically feed into focal adhesion stability and this would drive migration. And so we're, we're really working to try to understand what is this kind of coupling function and, and how do focal adhesions play into this? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we'll make this the last question and then I guess you can address the rest in the chat if you'd like, Andrew. 
Um, sure. So we've got a question from Raphael Petrosian. So thank you for an interesting talk. It looked like the MSD did not depend on the time with the power law when the cluster migrates on the collagen network. Is it known why? And is there a better model for that dependence? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. So, I mean, in order to, so, so I mean, a power law fit, a power law fit of, a, of a mean square displacement is always an imperfect measurement, right? Because no matter what you're measuring, you're always gonna have some kind of diffusive time scale. And, and depending on how many time points you take for your fit, you're gonna get a different exponent. And so, I mean, for us, we fix this at, a, at, at five hours and we do the fits at five hours. But I mean, if you take this MSD out longer, you're gonna get, you're gonna get diffusive behavior at long time scales. And so your exponent is gonna be a little bit lower. So we're looking into trying to now fit the MSD curves where we can extract something like a diffusive time scale, which is not going to be so dependent on on the amount of time that you fit, because you can basically fit all of the all of the time all of the time data, and and you can get one value for a diffusive time scale. Um, so good point. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really good talk. Lots of um, interesting questions. There's some more in the chat. If we have uh, extra time at the end, people want to stick around and ask you afterwards. We can totally do that. Um, yep. But for now, uh, we're going to uh, move on to our second talk of the hour. Um, so if you want to sh stop sharing your video, um, and then Jocelyn, you go ahead and start sharing. Um, and in the meantime, uh, so we, now we have Jocelyn McDonald. She's an associate professor at Kansas State University, where her lab studies how cell migration is regulated within the normal three-dimensional environment of tissues. Jocelyn primarily investigates collective cell migration in tissues using the model system of border cell migration in the developing Drosophila oocyte. So her lab uses a combination of live imaging, genetics, and cell biological approaches to uncover mechanisms that control multicellular collective cell migration. And um, I'll also just mention that we did not intentionally pair up these two talks about uh, clusters of cells migrating, but I think they go together really, really well. So uh, excited to hear um, from Jocelyn. Thank you. All right, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I also wanted to thank the organizers. This has been a great um, seminar series and I'm really excited to tell you um, about a current story from my lab um, that definitely ties very well into the um, previous talk. Okay, so as we know in vivo, um, cells can migrate as single cells or as collectives. And in cancer and some uh, developmental contacts, cells can um, interconvert between uh, migration modes. So some cells can go from collective to mesenchymal, um, mesenchymal to amoeboid, and back again. And what all of these cells have in common is that the cells are polarized um, with protrusions at the front or the leading edge. Um, and of course, they adhere to their migratory substrate. The challenge for collectives, especially collectives that have to stay together during their whole migration, is that they have to stay together and coordinate the movement of those multiple cells. And so the model system that we study um, occurs in the Drosophila ovary, the border cells, and these cells actually have to stay together during their entire migration. We've chosen to study this model because of the wealth of genetic tools, um, as well as live imaging that we can perform. <clears throat> so border cells migrate as part of development of the ovary. And these six to 10 cells um, actually bud off from the follicle cell monolayer, somatic monolayer. And they migrate as um, this little group um, between the germline derived nurse cells um, and take about three to four hours to migrate to the anterior border of the oocyte, which is actually how they get their name, border cells. Importantly, there are actually two cell types in um, the cluster of border cells. There's a central pair of organizing cells called polar cells, and you can see here, um, they actually express different um, transcription factors and different um, proteins. Um, and those central polar cells are surrounded by the migratory border cells. Okay, so we can perform live imaging and really see how dynamic this process is. 
you can see that the border cells have left the epithelium. They're migrating between the unlabeled nurse cells and move towards the oocyte. Um, they have a protrusion at the leading edge, um, typically only one to two protrusions. And there's communication amongst the cells so that only those cells at the leading edge have protrusions. Another um, fascinating aspect that I won't have time to talk about, but the, from the movie, you can hopefully see that the border cells actually can exchange places um, during migration. Um, and we still don't understand a lot about how that happens. But what we do know is that there's this amazing coordination of, um, of that migration. What we also know is that there are multiple serine threonine kinases that are part of this process. And earlier in the seminar series, we heard from Greg Emery's lab talking about a um, serine threonine kinase called misshapen that's involved in phosphorylating moesin and communicating amongst the border cells so that you have a polarized cluster that can migrate. But what we don't know much about is the serine threonine phosphatases that are involved in dephosphorylating um, these proteins. And so my lab wanted to understand um, and identify what these um, serine threonine phosphatases were. And so what we did was we um, looked for genes that were expressed during oogenesis um, using the modern code um, database. And we uh, performed RNAi knockdown just in the border cells and asked whether the border cells could make it to the oocyte at the right time. Um, that's shown here. We found one phosphatase, PP4, um, at least one RNAi line has a migration defect. But I won't be talking about that further today. Instead, I will tell you about this other phosphatase, protein phosphatase 1, um, where we had found a protein inhibitor. Um, this is an endogenous um, protein inhibitor called nuclear inhibitor of PP1 um, that had a very dramatic effect on migration. So what we found is that when we expressed this inhibitor, not only did the border cells have trouble making it to the oocyte, which is quantified here, but importantly, the clusters were falling apart. So we were able to quantify um, the um, number of um, uh, groups of uh, cells that have split apart. And you can see that um, we often will see more than three uh, little groups of border cells that have fallen apart, um, always along the uh, migratory pathway. So suggesting that protein phosphatase 1 is involved in keeping the cluster cohesive and migratory. So this is even better seen using live imaging. Um, <clears throat> As you can see here in this control, we have five or six border cells that are moving together, polarized, um, nicely moving together. However, when we express this NIPP1 in border cells, you can see that the border cells are struggling a little bit to migrate. Um, they are actually still able to move. Occasionally one border cell gets left behind. The cell shape has changed and they really have transformed the way that they're moving. Um, so we see some protrusions, um, but really very, very slow migration. Um, sometimes border cells can't migrate at all and others just take about two to three times um, the normal um, migration speed. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do was to confirm that this NIPP1 was indeed um, actually acting on protein phosphatase 1. So for those who are not always thinking about this particular class of proteins, um, protein phosphatase 1 uh, consists of a catalytic subunit that in vitro can dephosphorylate any serine threonine um, phosphorylations. However, in vivo, it's highly specific. And that's because of these regulatory subunit partners um, that bind to the PP1 catalytic subunit and then dock it at its specific phosphorylated target. In Drosophila, there are four catalytic subunits, um, and there's an estimated um, more than 200 um, regulatory subunits, not just in Drosophila, but in mammals that provide this high specificity for substrates. So we first check to see if any of these um, catalytic subunits are expressed in, in border cells. And indeed, um, PP1-alpha 96A and the PP1 beta homolog, which is also called flapwing or FLW, 
um, are expressed in border cells. We were unable to get reagents that um, would tell us where um, 87B and 13C are expressed, but we presume that they are indeed expressed. So next we wanted to determine if NIPP1 was inhibiting PP1 catalytic subunits in border cells. Uh, what is known is that um, in vitro, NIPP1 can block the catalytic activity of PP1C. It can also block activity in vivo. And so what we did was we provide, did a rescue experiment. So we overexpress NIPP1, which causes splitting of the cluster. Um, here you can see that very few stay in one intact cluster. But now when we overexpress PP1 um, alpha 96A or some of the other um, catalytic subunits, we see a significant suppression of that NIPP1 phenotype. Interestingly, when we overexpress the human homolog, we see almost complete suppression of that phenotype. And this is probably um, due to titration of um, the NIPP1 by overexpression of the PP1 catalytic subunit. What we next did was to look at um, the consequence of NIPP1 on PP1 catalytic sub, um, subcellular localization. So as I mentioned, um, flap wing, the PP1 beta homolog, is expressed in border cells. You can see cortical and cytoplasmic localization. But when we overexpress NIPP1, um, which here in red is, you can see is nuclear, we now relocalize um, flap wing to the nucleus. We were also able to show this with PP1 um, alpha 96A, demonstrating that not only can NIPP1 block PP1 catalytic activity in vitro, um, work done by others, but also can sequester um, the catalytic subunits into the nucleus. So we think this is specific. However, we wanted to confirm this by knocking down each one of the catalytic subunits themselves. So indeed, when we perform RNAi for each of the catalytic subunits, we can see um, migration defects and we can see that the cluster is fragmenting. All right, so then we perform live imaging and we see a very similar phenotype to what we saw with um, NIPP1. Uh, we can see very dramatic um, failure to migrate, but also cluster splitting. And you can see the cell shape has changed. Um, that's with knockdown by PP196 alpha RNAi. And with um, PP187B, sometimes we see that the cluster stays together most of the time and then forms a line. And then at the end, we can see some of the cells breaking off. And again, the, the speed of migration is very, very slow. All right, so what is, what is PP1 actually doing? What are the cellular consequences? So we saw very slow migration, suggesting that motility was, was abnormal. So we analyzed protrusions. We saw that the um, uh, number of protrusions was fairly normal, especially if a cluster was intact, but the length of that front protrusion was, was decreased. The size of the protrusions is very small. And, um, sorry, I just have to, uh, and um, the, um, sorry, <laughs> I can't see. Um, so we have very abnormal um, lifetime, sorry. So the speed, speed and lifetime of these is very, very abnormal. Okay, so that suggests that the motility is, is disrupted. But what else is going on? We could see that the clusters fall apart. We know that um, E. cadherin, beta catenin, and alpha catenin are important for the migration, um, as well as the traction uh, onto the nurse cells. And indeed, we see that when we knock down cadherin, um, beta catenin, and alpha catenin, we can also see um, the cluster splitting suggesting that this is a similar phenotype to what we see with um, inhibition of PP1 activity. So these similar phenotypes suggested to us that maybe PP1 is regulating um, the cadherin-catenin complex. So we um, stained um, NIPP1 expressing border cells for E cadherin and for beta-catenin. Um, I'm not showing beta-catenin. Um, but what we can normally see is that E. cadherin is highly expressed between border cells, um, but also surrounding um, the polar cells here in the center. When we 
uh, inhibit PP1, we can see a reduction in the levels of um, E cadherin as well as beta catenin, which I'm not showing. However, we do still see some um, cadherin still, still there, suggesting that PP1 is promoting um, maybe the levels um, or the stability of the cadherin catenin complex rather than just say expression of, of those um, proteins. Okay. So we, we see that there's an effect on adhesion between the border cells. Next, we wanted to look at the phenotype with the cell shape. So normally border cells um, are somewhere in between a very elongated and a very round um, cell. And we could measure this by measuring circularity. Um, and in fact, they have about a 0.7 um, circularity. Uh, but you can see that it's quite um, variable. Um, again, suggesting there's quite dynamic cell shape um, in the collective normally. However, when we express NIPP1, we can see that now the border cells are very, very round and are close to 0.9. Um, and there's very little variability. So these cells have become incredibly round. So round makes us think of actin myosin contractility. And so that was the next thing that we tested. So normally, um, all of the cells, of course, have F actin at the cortical, um, cyto uh, cortical um, cytoskeleton, but there's an enrichment of F actin on the outer edges of the cluster. However, when we express NIPP1, we see that each individual border cell now has a very intense um, uh, localization of F actin around each cell. So we've relocalized F actin from a collective level backed down to the single cell level. Okay, so next we looked at myosin um, and similar to what we heard in the previous talk, um, we do see normally an enrichment of um, myosin, which here we've labeled um, the light chain with GFP driven by its endogenous um, regulatory sequences. And you can see it's very dynamic um, on the outer edges of the, the group um, and highly um, enriched at the outer edge. However, when we express NIPP1, we can see that uh, we've relocalized myosin to each individual cell. What is interesting is that they're almost acting like the whole cluster, so they have very dynamic um, myosin. So myosin at the outer edge is controlled um, by PP1, and when PP1 activity is lost, we relocalize it to the single cell. So similarly, we see active myosin relocalization. Um, so normally phosphorylated um, regulatory light chain is found at the outer edge, shown here in red, and now can be found in between uh, and around each cell um, when we inhibit uh, PP1. Okay, so we are basically looking at um, switching from a collective to single cell mode by inactivating myosin. So mechanistically, um, we know that um, kinases such as rho kinase are going to phosphorylate and activate the regulatory light chain, which in turn activates uh, myosin. But of course, they also become inactivated through phosphatases. And the major phosphatase for the light chain is myosin phosphatase, which consists of a catalytic PP1 catalytic subunit and the myosin binding subunit MBS, also known as MYPT. And we know that NIPP1 can inhibit myosin phosphatase. So we wanted to see if myosin phosphatase was involved. First, we confirmed that the myosin binding subunit is expressed in border cells, and it is. It co-localizes nicely um, with one of the catalytic subunits, flapwing. And as I mentioned, that uh, PP1C MBS complex can dephosphorylate the light chain. When we knock down MBS, we see that the border cells round up and they can um, dissociate and they also have migration defects. What I will point out is that this phenotype is milder than what we see with both NIPP1 or catalytic um, RNAi. This either suggests that we're not completely knocking down MBS, although based on antibody staining, we do think we have a pretty strong knockdown, or more likely we have additional um, 
PP1 complexes that are important for this process. Okay, so to sum up this part of the talk, um, we, I've shown you that um, PP1 is important for uh, regulating collective level adhesion and contractility. And it does this partly through um, the myosin phosphatase, which is involved in collective actomyosin dependent contractility. However, um, we also are regulating adhesion between the border cells, motility, and leaving the epithelium or delamination. And those may be um, regulated by different regulatory um, subunits. Okay, so we think this balance of kinase and phosphatases is important for um, collective movement. So in the last um, couple minutes, I just wanted to tell you about an unpublished story um, where we're trying to look for these additional regulatory subunits. And of course, these regulatory subunits bring specificity um, to dephosphorylation of the targets. So what we did was we, we called the literature. Um, there are many um, uh, publications that have looked for proteins with these specific motifs that bind to the catalytic subunit, as well as known um, PP1 interacting proteins. We identified the Drosophila homologs um, and performed RNAi and looked for impairment of migration as just our crude assay for requirement. So, so far we have a fairly long list, um, but one of these genes, PP1, um, PPP1R15 or GAD34, um, which I'll just call R15, um, had multiple RNAi lines um, that had a very strong effect. And I just wanted to show you just a little bit of um, our, our current data. So what we know so far is that when we knock down this gene, um, we see a very strong effect on migration. So the border cells actually have trouble delaminating from the epithelium. Um, they do still form protrusions. We've done some live imaging. Um, these protrusions seem um, less effective um, for pulling the border cells out of the epithelium. Um, and we have just created um, CRISPR alleles to uh, basically look for um, complete loss of function of this, this gene. Um, interestingly, we saw an increase of border cell number when we knocked down the, this gene. So normally, uh, I told you about six to 10 cells are in a cluster, um, but the average is about six. Whereas in, with the R15 RNAi, we see um, 10 and probably even more border cells um, per cluster. And this typically means that we have um, misregulation of the pathways that are involved in cell specification of the border cells. And so what we, we find, uh, what, what we think is potentially happening, we're still investigating, is that the jack stat pathway is misregulated. Now, what is interesting with this protein is that it normally only has one substrate. And that is EIF2-alpha, which is a st ER stress-induced um, translation factor. Now we don't think, at least we don't know so far, that ER stress per se is important in border cells, but maybe there's some sort of homeostatic regulation of this pathway um, involved in um, cell fate. And so that's something that we're currently pursuing. Okay, and so I've already told you all this, so I'm just gonna skip over those conclusions and uh, end by acknowledging the people who have done the work. Um, most of this work was done by a talented postdoc, Eugene Chen, um, along with a current graduate student, Nirpama Kotian, who did all of the adhesion work. And um, this discovery was originally made um, by another graduate student, uh, former graduate student in my lab, George Aranwez. Um, I'd like to thank the rest of that team, um, plus my collaborators in Toulouse, uh, Xiaoba Wang and Damia Ramel. I didn't have time to talk about their um, contribution to the project. And finally, um, last but not least, I'd really like to thank um, the National Science Foundation, who's been a primary um, funder of my work. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Jocelyn. That was really, really interesting. Um, I just wanted to start out with a, a question from me. Um, so given that the PP1 
seems to be regulating just so many components that are generally important in collective migration. Is it essential for other migration processes during morphogenesis? Um, or is it, does it seem to be really specific to the border cells? Actually, we, we don't really know that. Um, we, we personally have not tested it um, in Drosophila. As far as I know, there are not any studies, but um, there's a beautiful study from a few years ago um, looking at enteric neural crest cell migration and in, um, I believe, zebrafish. And um, in this case, what's really interesting is it also is important for regulation of myosin um, but also integrins. Um, and similarly, um, inhibition of this pathway uh, switches the cells to a, these kind of more from mesenchymal shapes to more round um, shapes. So at least in that particular case, um, so I don't think it's limited to border cells, but I think um, it's a real open question uh, what, else it's, what else it's involved in, yeah. Yeah, that's really, really interesting because I mean, it's clearly, plugging into some just broadly important pathways here. Yeah. So very cool. Okay, we have a question from Hamid Badmos, who says, thanks for the talk, Jocelyn. Is there any autonomous requirement for PP1 in polar cells? Yeah, so we tested polar cells. We thought for sure it was going to be involved um, because I didn't have time to tell you, but um, nice work from Denise Montel's lab has shown that adhesion um, of border cells to polar cells is really important um, through e-cadherin. So we thought, okay, you know, PV1 is regulating that. Um, we expressed NIPP1 in the polar cells and we've never seen a phenotype. Um, it's always possible that there's a little bit of residual activity, um, but as far as we can tell right now, it seems to be autonomous to the border cells themselves. Yeah, great question. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, from Jonas Hartman, uh, cortical actin organization, adhesion, and protrusion all affect each other. Is it possible that PP1 really primarily affects myosin regulation and the resulting changes in cell mechanics affect the other aspects of the phenotype? And how would you separate the primary versus the secondary effects? Um, yeah, thank you for asking that question. So uh, um, the reviewers of our manuscript actually asked us that question too. So we actually went back and we, we tested it. So. Um, I won't go into all of the details. It's actually sometimes even confuses me. But what we did was we, um, we knocked down myosin and we knocked down coherence. And what I can tell you is that in each case, those affect F actin, but opposite direction to what we see with um, PP1 inhibition. So it's not necessarily that they're not interrelated, um, but um, we don't think so. Right at the moment, we think that the adhesion effects are separate from the myosin effects. Um, and that's due to the fact that we, we don't see similar phenotypes when we knock down the adhesion alone and the myosin alone. Thanks. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Pilar Ramos. Uh, great talk, thanks, Jocelyn. Uh, taking into account that singed is an actin bundle protein that also is regulated by phosphorylation and that you use its antibody to observe these migratory cells, have you ever found any effect on the staining per se, meaning on singed, on your RNAi experiments? Yeah, so we never saw any particular change in the levels um, or localization of FASN, um, which is called singed in Drosophila. Um, so Right now, as far as like F actin regulators, we don't really have any clue. I'm positive there must be some, some effects on, um, on, on some F actin regulators. My personal thought is maybe um, court, um, uh, there's a different regulator that might be involved, but, but so far um, FASN does not seem to be one of them, yeah. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has any uh, last minute questions, feel free to type them in or um, jump in now. But um, otherwise we're actually um, finishing on time. So thank you both so much for, for keeping your talks within the, the time limit. Um, and that's gonna be it for us for, um, for this week. Oh, one more last minute uh, from Mohammed.
Uh, have you performed a chimeric cluster experiment for knockout and control cells? Um, we have not. Um, well, sort of. So we have made, um, so not surprisingly, the catalytic subunits are uh, pretty important for um, cell viability. So when um, te our technical way of knocking out um, the genes are with um, early loss of mosaic, like so mosaic loss of function, um, often you might not get a cluster then if, if, if that happens. But we were able to, um, with flap wing, make partially mosaic clusters and those still fell apart. Um, so I don't know that we've completely, like we can't do the other way. We haven't been able to do the other way around, which is um, we didn't do um, say NIPP1 in some cells and not in others, which would be a better way of testing that particular question. But I, I like that idea and it's something we probably should do, yeah. Okay, awesome, thanks so much, um, maybe. Okay, one more. Alexander George, uh, appreciate the talk. Um, appeared, it appeared from some of your videos that the clusters dissociated more towards the end of the migration. Do you see any variability in rounding or the cortical actomyosin network based on distance that the cluster migrated? Yeah, great question. So um, adhesion, definitely, we see that they fall apart as they're moving. Um, but the um, cortical actin um, myosin seems to be early. Um, so we see that almost towards the beginning of when they're migrating. And so we don't think that that is necessarily changing as, as they're moving, that that's an early phenotype right away that they, that they have. Um, it can be variable though. So um, certainly with the RNAi for some of the catalytic subunits, we sometimes see maybe a little less rounding um, than we do with some of the other ones. But, but yeah, we think that's pretty early phenotype. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the live stream on YouTube. Um, so goodbye to everybody on there and see you next week.